Good evening. My name is Kevin Bergerson, and I am a program manager with the Colon Cancer Alliance, and I would like to welcome you to the Colon Cancer Alliance's first webinar in 2017, Interventional Radiology 101. Interventional radiologists are specialized cancer treatment physicians and are often overlooked as sources of cutting edge therapy options. Besides biopsy and port placement, interventional radiologists also provide targeted, minimally invasive, non-surgical options to their patients. Some of these options include thermal tumor ablations through the skin and catheter-based chemo or radiation seeds directly into the vessel supplying tumors. The webinar will discuss all these options plus a wide variety of others. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and all registrants will receive a link to where we have posted the webinar recording. Before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone that neither the Colon Cancer Alliance nor the presenter are giving medical advice and no doctor-patient relationship is intended or established. You should always seek in-person medical advice and make medical decisions together with your individual clinician team. It is my pleasure at this time to introduce this evening's speaker who is from the University of Arizona Cancer Center, Dr. Charles T. Hennemeyer. After obtaining a medical degree from St. Louis University Medical School in 2001, Dr. Hennemeyer completed his residency in diagnostic radiology at UCLA in 2006. Dr. Hennemeyer is board certified in diagnostic radiology and nuclear medicine with a certificate of vascular and interventional radiology qualification by the American Board of Radiology. Dr. Hennemeyer currently serves as section chief for Vascular and Interventional Radiology and as Program Director of Vascular and Interventional Radiology Fellowship at the University of Arizona Cancer Center in Tucson, Arizona. Dr. Hennemeyer was honored with the George R. Barnes Teacher of the Year Award at the University of Arizona Department of Radiology and also was presented an award for Outstanding Achievement in Pathology from St. Louis University Medical School. Dr. Hennemeyer was also a popular guest presenter at our recent Metastatic Colorectal Cancer Symposium that the Colon Cancer hosted last uh, November in Mesa, Arizona. And with that, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Dr. Hennemeyer. Uh, Dr. Hennemeyer, it's a tremendous pleasure having a fellow Arizona and Wildcat here with us this evening. Welcome, Dr. Hennemeyer. All right. Thanks very much, Kevin. So um, <clears throat> I'm hoping uh, you all can see this here. And... Uh, How's it? How's it looking, Kevin? Okay. Looks perfect. You're uh, off. You go, sir. Okay. So um, I'm hoping to uh, be able to uh, describe what interventional radiologists are and uh, how you may have interacted with one before as uh, as a patient. And uh, they kind of go under the radar, and a lot of people don't know who they are. And uh, sometimes they are in places where you don't see them. So I want to talk a bit about. Um, uh, who they are, what they do, and then I'm going to show you uh, some pictures and some examples of some technology and um, some things that might inspire you a little bit. So um, uh, if, if you all don't know, which I'm sure you probably do, colorectal cancer, I wanted to uh, describe how it begins. Uh, it's one of the prototypical diseases which begins as a, as a polyp um, shown in the left of that image, stage one, and then has the potential of growing into an actual tumor. Um, it's an awfully common uh, uh, form of cancer and uh, definitely a worthy topic. Um, so interventional radiologists do a lot of work in the liver, and so the liver is not the colon. So what is the connection exactly? Uh, the connection is that the liver is, uh, is the site of choice for um, colon cancer to metastasize or move to. If it chooses to go somewhere, it usually goes there first. So. Um, that's not entirely a bad thing because we have a lot of uh, therapy options once it's in the liver. And um, that may be the first time you become aware of an interventional radiologist. Um, the reason it goes to the liver is the, the blood supply and the lymphatic supply of the colon is uh, the liver. So things that flow from the colon to somewhere else usually go through the liver first. Um, there's a number of ways of dealing with a uh, with a, a tumor or a metastasis um, in the in the liver, and uh, I'll go over some of the basic ones. Um, but um, 
the, uh, the ways you might interact with an interventional radiologist are you may meet them first when you get a, a needle biopsy. Um, and um, that's usually done through the skin. You lay in a CAT scanner or maybe an ultrasound and they uh, guide a needle into that uh, little tumor and take a piece. Um, if, if that makes sense to you, then it's not much of a stretch to imagine um, doing an ablation through uh, the skin using an ablation device, which is shown kind of the upper middle. Looks like a spider-like uh, uh, wire uh, thing that's uh, enveloping a, a kind of cream-colored tumor there. That is an ablation device and it's placed just like a biopsy. So if you've had a biopsy, an ablation can be a very similar experience. On the lower right, there's an image um, showing the alternative uh, big division in the way we treat cancers in the liver. One is through the skin and one is through the arteries. So in the lower right you see um, some little particles in those red arteries there and those are our therapeutic particles that might consist of a number of things. They could be little radioactive spheres and you may have heard Y90 or yttrium 90 and um, that would fit in that category. You might have heard of chemoembolization or TACE, like trans-arterial chemoembolization TACE. Uh, those are all kind of the same things and instead of those little particles being radioactive, they might be particles containing chemotherapy that you inject into the tumor. So um, here's an image of, uh, of what it might look like um, if you were uh, asleep and laying on an interventional radiology table. That thing rotating around is an x-ray and um, it takes uh, pictures that look kind of like this. Uh, these are uh, not actually CAT scans or MRIs. These are actually obtained with fluoroscopy, which is just plain x-ray. And as that device rotates around you, you can create pictures like this. This is kind of the high point of technology at the moment. Uh, these would be considered uh, uh, really beautiful. A guy like me looks at these and kind of drools. So once, once you start looking at people in three dimensions, there's a, it opens up a lot of potential for some pretty innovative uh, ways of treating cancers. Uh, on the upper, um, upper gray images, gray and white, you can see those white balls. Um, those are tumors in the liver. On the lower images, you see the color red and yellow, and um, that is the area where the contrast is accumulating, and it happens to be showing the tumor. So here's, a, uh, here's an image. Uh, that can be obtained at that same time. When that machine was rotating around, there was a catheter in the artery that goes to the liver and there are injected contrast. And um, this is an, another way of looking at the same data. So you can see I'm rotating around, looking at just the vascular supply of that liver. And um, uh, suddenly it's very much a three-dimensional uh, process. So um, this is kind of what it looks like. Uh, I can rotate it different ways. Um, or we could scroll through the images like a, uh, like a CAT scan. Um, in this case, you can see the uh, liver is that white, white structure, and there's a coming up right now a white kind of ball right there. That light-colored white ball is actually one of the tumors. So you can imagine how uh, an individual could use these images to find the artery that goes to those tumors and inject something. So um, if you imagine that, you'd be imagining chemoembolization and yttrium. Uh, radioembolization. Here's another example of a liver showing up. All that white stuff is actually tumor in, in liver and um, all of that is going to get treated coming up here. So um, uh, another one of the same. I'm, I'm happy the videos are working because uh, it's kind of fun to see what uh, technology can do. Um, so um, the um, the uh, I kind of already talked about this, but uh, manipulating the images, you can figure out what's what's supposed to be there and what's not, and then uh, next step, decide how to treat it. So let's think of uh, the two categories of embolization again, or ablation, as, as two categories being embolization and ablation. Embolization is injecting something through an artery, and ablation or ablation is uh, putting a, a needle or a probe or an instrument through the skin. So uh, it's pretty helpful to divide everything up into those two categories because uh, it keeps it simple um, and then it prevents you from getting confused because you'll see a slide like this or somebody talking, oh, I had, I had cryo or I had microwave or the RFA worked or didn't work or maybe somebody comes up with irreversible electroporation or IRE. It can get uh, confusing, but it doesn't have to be because these are all really the same thing. They're different forms of energy used to um, ablate or destroy a tumor by putting a probe through the skin, basically. Um, 
I thought uh, we'd talk about probably the prototypical one first. I bet I bet um, all of you have heard of RFA or radio frequency ablation, so RFA. Um, so let's talk about that. Uh, we're actually using less of this these days, but um, the principles are really very uh, applicable to everything. Um, so it's a it's actually an electrical current that uh, goes from the needle, which which I place through the skin in the tumor, and then it comes out. Uh, through the grounding pads that are on those legs down there, and um, it uh, it it creates um, excitation of molecules that um, becomes heat. So it's a very much a prototype of the thermal types of ablation. So it, it heats it heats the tumor. Uh, it, we're also going to show you something that uh, cools the tumor, or freezes it. Um, so uh, okay, yeah, that's right. The animation is working well. Well, that's pretty neat. So that's the idea. Very much an electrical thing. If you have a pacemaker, you might be wondering, is this okay? Uh, most cases, it's okay to do it with a pacemaker. Um, this uh, maybe would scare a person looking at this, thinking, oh my god, they're going to put that in my liver. These are done under conscious sedation or general anesthesia. So uh, they're actually not something to be that scared of. Um, uh, they're not very painful, and often many people do them with general anesthesia, so you're completely asleep. Uh, so even though it looks a bit scary, it's not. Luckily, the liver doesn't really feel pain. It's just the capsule or the covering on the outside. Uh, the rest uh, doesn't really care. So when you turn these things on, you don't actually feel much. And um, you're asleep anyway, so you wouldn't care. Um, these things usually take a few hours. The actual heating might take uh, 10, 15 minutes, maybe even a little more. But uh, during that time, you're asleep and you don't care. Um, there's a limitation of this technology that you may have uh, thought if uh, in your mind you look and say, well, that ablation device is only you know, a certain diameter. What if the tumor is much bigger? Um, if you thought that, you would have uncovered the main limitation here, which is these things only create an ablation so big. So if uh, <coughs> you have multiple tumors or they're um, too large, then you can imagine how this won't work. But uh, there's other options which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, uh, going back, just so I don't leave you hanging, those other options are inject stuff through arteries, so that's coming up. Here's an example on the image on the on the uh, left is a tumor, and uh, you may not see it, um, but if you look at the image on the right, you'll see a, a white circle enhanced um, kind of uh, looks like a, a lake or um, a pond or something. That is the post ablation. So then if you look at that same spot on the image on the right, that was the tumor. So we took the tumor on the left, turned it into that ablation site on the right, and um, hopefully this is a good re result. This looks like a good result. Um, let's talk about another type of heat. If any of you have had microwave or uh, heard of microwave, it's very much like radio frequency ablation that we just talked about, RFA. Microwave is the same sort of uh, device as you have uh, in your microwave to cook food. It's the same idea. <coughs> Instead of uh, electrical current, it's actually a, um, uh, they call it a, an antenna, but to me it seems more like a transmitter. Basically waves um, emanate in all directions from the tip of the needle that you put in and, um, and create an ablation. Um, the images down below are kind of com computer simulations of effects of if you put in more than one ablation needle at a time, how might they affect each other. Um, microwave is uh, interesting in that it ablates things that are a little larger, like maybe seven centimeters or so. Um, it's a little quicker, although it doesn't really matter once you're asleep. Matters to me, um, but but won't you? And it tends to cause a bit more uh, pain actually. Um, so I like to do those um, with uh, general anesthesia usually myself, but you'll find a lot of personal preference. Um, here's what uh, microwave might look like. This is a CT on the top and an MRI on the bottom, and this is after an ablation was performed. Um, it looks very similar to microwave, and um, uh, you can kind of get a size for how big a tumor might be. That's about as big of a tumor as you can deal with with the microwave. Um, let's talk about cryoablation. I like cryoablation lately. I've been using it a lot. I found it awfully useful. Uh, one interesting thing is it doesn't cause much pain, which wasn't generally general knowledge until I uh, started um, using it and found that it was uh, much less pain. Uh, cryoablation is exactly what it sounds, cryo meaning cold, and uh, so we're going to create an ice ball. And using a needle again, needle through the skin, guided with my, my hand and ultrasound and CT, 
and uh, usually use multiple probes and the uh, interaction of the individual probes creates an ice ball that's shown down below on that, that CT image with three kind of white linear things. Those are each probes and uh, that area that's uh, dark and surrounding those uh, probes, that's actually the ice ball. So you can actually see the ice ball, which is a very helpful um, factor for me when I'm doing this. It helps me know if I'm actually ablating the whole thing or not. Um, it's based on, uh, it's based on uh, very much like your air conditioner. You take compressed gas, uh, which is liquid form. You, you release it quickly at the end of the needle on the inside, and it turns to gas, and that sucks up heat and becomes cold, so uh, identical to an air conditioner. Um, if you guys are thinking, um, but I don't have a renal cancer I, or a liver cancer, I have a colon cancer, or um, does this, does any of this matter based on what tumor type you have? Um, it doesn't matter. These are, these devices are all pretty caveman, simple, stupid. They're like a, uh, they're, they're like a hammer. If you, if you hit something, it, it dies. So if you place the probes correctly and you turn the device on for the correct amount of time, whatever tissue you've placed them into is ablated and destroyed. So it doesn't matter if it's a, an HCC or a liver cancer or a met from the colon or something else. Uh, there's no differentiation. This is uh, what a vendor um, supplied uh, a, a handout might look like and this helps a user like me decide which probe to use, how long to turn it on, and what sort of size ablation zone. Those balls are the ice ball. And uh, so you get different sizes based on what you're trying to achieve. Here's an actual case. Uh, this is my fellow. I trained him last year and uh, off the good guy, kind of miss him. And uh, there is an ice ball in the image on the lower right. Uh, we turned on the device in a little, a little cup of saline. <coughs> and look what happened. That's literally a, a cold ice ball. This is how the procedure is actually done. Patients uh, lay in there sedated or completely asleep. He's got ultrasound in one hand, looking at that screen, uh, watching the needle go into the right spot. Then uh, behind off the screen is the CAT scanner, so I can run you in and out of the scanner and know uh, how things are looking. The ultrasound and CT stuff looks different on the two, and so sometimes one works better than the other, so it's a luxury to have both. Um, so switching gears, we've been talking about ablation through the needle, uh, needle through the skin, freezing, heating, electrocuting, whatever. Um, now we're going to move on to what happens if my tumor is too large or there's too many of them. How can you put a needle into, uh, you know, 10 tumors? Well, you probably can't. So um, it doesn't mean that this next topic is inferior, embolization. It just means it's uh, a necessity in those conditions when you have a lot of tumors or they're large. Uh, I know you're going to want to know what large is. Maybe roughly three to five centimeters is kind of the typical cutoff. When it starts getting much bigger than that, you might be going to uh, embolization, which means going through the artery. So um, I have an aesthetic appeal to this image, so I thought I'd show you, break up the discussion a little bit. That's a hepatic or liver angiogram on the left. And uh, when I took it, I thought, wow, that is, that is pretty. That looks exactly like a, uh, a Japanese cherry tree. Um, in the spring, so uh, I put that picture over there. And uh, so, so here's an example. Here's a, a lady with uh, a colon mets to the liver. Um, you can see that the uh, the tumor. Uh, I'd like to direct your eyes to that upper image at the top. It's a cross section. It's an MRI. Um, that real white organ is the spleen. The, uh, the there's a round dot in the uh, circle in the middle. That's the aorta. And then uh, to the left of that is the liver. And you can see in the center, it looks like there's this dark uh, cauliflower looking thing. It doesn't look homogeneous like the rest. That's a tumor. If your eyes are sharp and you're noticing a little ring-like thing above that, um, that's also a little tumor. So this, this is much larger than three or four centimeters. This can't be dealt with, with uh, through the skin needles. So um, this case is an example of embolization. So um, I needed to put something through an artery into that tumor. Uh, in order to either deliver chemotherapy directly to the tumor or to deliver radioactive particles. And um, so uh, in this case, I chose radioactive particles. And uh, that is known as radioembolization, uh, sometimes abbreviated Y90. 
sometimes abbreviated um, like the vendor, Sirtex, like S-I-R-T-E-X. So S-I-R-T-E-X is the one I use, although uh, I think both vendors are really equivalent. The other is Therasphere, like T-H-E-R-A, and then Sphere, S-P-H-E-R-E. Um, the vendor doesn't actually matter, but if you ever want to go to their website and look up what are these things, that's where you'll find them. There's only two choices. So you can see below, there's a catheter coming up, that white line. You can see those dark uh, tree-like branching thing. That's the, uh, the liver and the angiogram. And uh, on the image to the right, you can see the same image uh, a few minutes later after uh, contrast is washed through. And uh, if I had a pointer, I'd show you there's kind of a, looks like a dark black cloud uh, at the top of that last image. That's the actual tumor enhancing. So. Um, this uh, lady had a great result, so everybody wants to show you all the great results, of course, um, but uh, the reality is uh, they don't always work perfectly. Um, this one did really well. Uh, I wish I could predict better um, what makes them work better. Uh, certainly everybody is working on figuring that out. Um, on the upper left, there's an image one month after. Uh, uh, in the middle, you see six months after, it's shrinking, and on the lower right, it's really shrinking. Um, this actual lady, you know, I'm about just spitting out the straight truth. This lady did great for about two years. Uh, she was fairly disease-free. Um, we were expecting uh, not such a great response. Um, I was hoping it would be durable and wouldn't come back. Eventually it did come back. And uh, I treated her again on the left, and uh, that gave her some more time. But um, uh, what we're looking at was previously really untreatable. This is not surgically resected. It's in a bad spot. It's big. Um, so uh, even though uh, it's not perfect, uh, we definitely bought a lot of extra time, and that, that is a realistic expectation. Um, I think the averages we're buying a lot of extra time, hopefully. We're not often curing things completely, um, although uh, there are definitely cases where we do. Things that are curable are generally small and few, and uh, uh, things that are less curable are big and multiple. Here's another example. Um, up, image upper left is an MRI, and you can see it looks kind of like a sponge or soap bubbles in that liver that I'm trying to kind of teach you um, to recognize the half of the liver is tumor up there. If you look at the image in the middle, that's taken uh, during the angiogram with that, that C arm thing rotating around you, and the image in the lower right is the uh, enhancement. Uh, computer looks at the way contrast goes in and tells me where the tumor is. Uh, you don't really need that if you do this every day, but uh, it makes for great pictures to show you guys. Um, here is uh, an example of uh, uh, an RFA, which I uh, think this slides out of order, so I'm going to skip over it. Um, here's another ablation I suppose I could show you. Uh, I think we're a little bit low on time. But uh, the image on the left, there's a tiny little tumor right next to the gallbladder. The image in the middle, we used uh, something called irreversible electroporation needles and ablated it, and uh, kind of a, a, a good result. Little things like this that I'm, I'm kind of going through quickly are, are curable because they're small and few. So if you find an IR guy or gal who can get the needle in that correct spot, then this is, can be very much a cure. Okay, so um, we're getting a little towards the end. Um, what what do you feel like when you're done with one of these procedures? I mean, this is totally benign. You take out the needles or take out the catheter and you go home and everything is great, or are you just in pure agony and you um, wish that you'd gotten chemo or surgery or something? Um, so it's, it's variable. I think uh, uh, people are almost never in agony. It's not the extreme. It's uh, certainly recovery is, much, recovery is much faster than surgery. Um, I wouldn't tell you that this is better than surgery, it's just different. I think in the future there's more and more of this type of uh, thing going on than surgery as in just resecting or cutting out the tumor, but uh, there is absolutely a place for surgery. I don't, I don't do surgeries in the traditional sense, um, but I certainly send uh, some patients to the surgeon because there's some people really are better served with that. So this is not a, uh, a substitute, um, but it is kind of the newer, sexier thing people don't generally know about. So, as you'd hoped, the recovery is much smaller. We're just putting a, either a, a tiny hole in the artery or one in the skin. Um, there's not a lot of healing necessary. Um, there's a range of pain. I told you microwave tends to hurt a bit more, um, quite a bit more, and cryoablation tends not to hurt at all. The embolizations, or the ones where we're injecting things through the skin, don't hurt much at all, but you can get 
a bit of a feeling of malaise that usually starts a few days later and might last a week. Uh, malaise like you kind of think you might have a flu or you're getting a little sick or maybe a little depressed or just laying around don't want to do anything, that kind of feeling. Uh, you shouldn't shouldn't be throwing up, um, shouldn't be stuck on the, in the restroom for some reason, it's uh, not like that. Um, uh, I, I give out some pain medications and occasionally things for nausea, but it's uh, fairly unusual. Um, most of these patients go home the same day. Uh, occasionally, we do admit people. It's often because maybe they're complicated and there's other things going on. Um, maybe it's convenient because they live a long way away. Uh, that's just reality. Those are some of the real reasons. Um, but I would say the majority of the time, we, you're able to go home. And uh, at the time I wrote this, uh, maybe last year, I said a third of the time you uh, stay. That's probably true. It might even be less. Um, I think when you're when you're talking to an interventional radiologist, so now we're kind of getting out of the disease and more towards the provider and uh, who are they and should you talk to one and what do they do. Um, interventional radiology is an interesting specialty, as you heard in um, Kevin describing who, who I am and how I trained. Uh, we start as radiologists. And meaning radiologists read images, x-rays, they put a report in the computer and they don't usually see patients. Interventional broke off from that specialty, not, not fully, but we're very, very different. We actually uh, don't read images any, anymore. We only do procedures. We see patients before and after in the clinic and uh, we're in, in the middle of all the decision making and uh, you get to know us and you really ought to be able to see your interventional radiologist face to face. That is uh, certainly the, the new training pathway which I'm involved in, and so I, I probably should advocate that that's really the correct way to, to practice. Um, uh, here's uh, what we look like uh, at U of A, um, uh, which is uh, partly Banner. We're in Tucson. This is a typical middle-sized practice. Um, each of us have different uh, areas of interest. So some like urologic things, some are hepatobiliary, uh, two of them are pediatric, one's neuro, so, uh, but they're all interventional radiology. So uh, it's a pretty interesting practice and I'm hoping you guys can type in some questions so I can, um, I can answer them. All right, I think that's it. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hennemeyer. Um, we had a couple questions come in. And as a reminder for everybody here, uh, if you do have a question, uh, that's great. We intend our webinars uh, to be electronically interactive. And at this time, we will be taking your written questions via the chat feature on the uh, GoToWebinar control panel on the right-hand side of your screens at home. To submit a question, click on the small plus sign located next to the word questions. Uh, again, that's on the right, the control panel on the right side of your screen. Type your question in and then hit enter. If you're unable to get to your question tonight, we'll be able to get back with you by email in the very near future. So the uh, very first question that we have is from okay. uh, one of our listeners who would like to know what is IRE and uh -huh. where can a patient find that? Oh yeah. Okay. So that's that's neat. Um, IRE is in, uh, is uh, irreversible electroporation, and if those letters don't fit together to make sense to you, they don't to me either. But uh, IRE is a uh, interesting that patients come up with that question uh, not infrequently. I've had people come to me asking, "I need an IRE," and uh, so I'm thinking that the company that makes them that's doing some good marketing or something, because uh, nobody ever says, "I really want microwave, not cryo," or something else. IRE is uh, it's in the category of ablation, so it's not through the artery. It's uh, uh, using needles. When I kind of uh, casually said, oh, we electrocute a tumor, uh, I didn't talk about it, but that's essentially IRE. So uh, one, we, we do those here, and we do those a number of other places. If you, if you know enough to have requested that, you've probably gone to the vendor site, which um, I believe will tell you um, uh, the uh, specific names of providers that are doing them in different places in the country. But um, I think the way I can help you is, is tell you what it is and what I use it for. I used uh, it for a lot of patients uh, a few years ago when it was relatively new. Um, it had some big advantages of um, being um, uh, relatively non-damaging to other structures and it wasn't thermal so it doesn't get hot and it doesn't get cold. So why would you choose that over anything else? 
um, the reason is uh, if you've got a tumor that's let's say it's in the liver and it's uh, real close to another uh, important structure like maybe a, a vein or real close to the gallbladder like an image I actually showed you but didn't really tell you it was IRE uh, one might choose to use something that doesn't get hot or cold and then doesn't kind of perpetuate the, the damage too far out. Um, IRE consists of a number of probes or needles and you place them around the periphery of the tumor, around the outside edge, not in the direct center, which is very much opposite of all the other ablation types. So it's almost like a, a, a kid standing around a ring then kicking a ball between each other. Um, that's uh, what happens with IRE. Electrical current is sent between the individual probes and everything that's in the ring is ablated. Um, the reason I'm using it a lot less lately is I've, uh, I am learning to prefer cryoablation. It has very similar properties. It's quite a bit easier to use and I can get much, much larger ablations. IRE is a bit limited in that way. Also, IRE is uh, fairly difficult. I'd say technical challenge-wise for your IR doc who's working on you, it's probably the highest one. So um, I'm thinking if you, um, for some reason, have decided you really want IRE, then uh, you probably want somebody who's doing a lot of them. Uh, I got a fair number of reoccurrences at the edges. In other words, the tumor gr started growing back at the margin or the edge, which was uh, disconcerting and um, I didn't like that, and I really did quite a few, and I was still um, running into that problem. Uh, so I would say it would be a very legitimate question when you meet your IR doc, um, hopefully in a clinic before uh, the procedure day, separate place, different site, and you have a chance to sit down and talk with them. I'd ask them if they, what tools do they have? Do they have IRE, microwave, cryo, RFA? Um, and uh, which one do they want to use on you and, and why? That's a very legitimate question. Um, but in the end, uh, probably you want them to decide. Um, but hopefully they'll be able to inspire some confidence in you. Excellent. Yeah, what else have you got there? Excellent. We have uh, uh, several other questions that are coming in. We're going to do our best to handle each and every one of them. Next question is, what is the maximum size or number of tumors that is ideally treated this way? Right. So, um, so the, the simplest one is a microwave, and it achieves kind of the largest ablation zone. It's a pretty um, reasonable to ask it to do a four centimeter tumor with a single probe. Um, uh, that these things changes as technology changes. Uh, about ten years or so ago, when microwave came out, it actually created ablations that were too large and uncontrollable. Uh, and they were they were impressive, but you don't want it to be uncontrollable. You want to you want to get the ablation size you're expecting. So uh, over this time uh, since there's been a change in the technology that now you get a very consistent ablation. It's still the biggest one uh, um, for the most part, and it's about four centimeters, I'd say. Your second question was well, how many can you treat? That's going to be very dependent on the the doc you're talking to. I think three uh, tumors in one day is a is a fair amount of uh, effort and time, and uh, not that that effort and time is limited, but you can only be asleep on a table for so long. Um, you can only uh, have um, sedation, conscious sedation, or general anesthesia for so long before things start to happen, like uh, lungs start to collapse a little bit, and the liver starts moving up kind of towards your head, starts getting harder to see things. Um, so it's not that you have a lazy IR doc, it's that um, you can only work for a couple hours before you got to stop. So I would say in general terms, four centimeters and uh, three tumors. Um, I think it's not unreasonable maybe to come back for a second ablation to do two sessions, so maybe a total of six. When you're getting into things in that, those numbers, though, uh, you might be or should be thinking about uh, embolization or transarterial things. So, um, but it's a good question to ask the, the IR doc that you're sitting across from. Um, how many are they willing to do, and how how big can they get? Excellent. And I have another question here: um, Do you use liver enzyme values to decide? Uh, how many times to use ablation procedures? Yeah, absolutely. So that's a great question. So how do you screen a patient to know whether it's safe and they can tolerate it? So liver enzymes are an, a great indicator of how, how well the liver's doing. Um, I would say for, for most of the percutaneous ones or through the skin ablations, putting a needle through the skin, that whole big category we spent most of the time on, 
those are not uh, the liver function tests are not so important for those because they're pretty focal. You know, you're ablating an area the size of a golf ball in in an organ which is the size of uh, oh, you know, like a, a watermelon. So it's not relative. It's not such a large area that you're disturbing. So you can get away with, in other words, fairly poor liver function and still do an ablation. Now, if you're going to inject things through an artery, then the liver functions become real important because when you're injecting things through the artery, you're, you're affecting much larger uh, portions of the liver, a much bigger wedge of the pie or a bigger piece. And in those cases, the liver functions matter a lot. And um, if you um, are listening to this webinar, you probably are pretty interested in detail, so I'm going to just spit it out. If you've got uh, liver disease, your total bilirubin, or T-B-I-L-I, -I, or total bilirubin is a great number that a lot of us use. Um, if it's uh, if it's much above uh, two and a half or so, may not may not uh, want to do ar arterial embolizations. It would be better if it were lower. Um, if you're looking for a uh, through the skin ablation, uh, you could have a much higher bilirubin, and that would be fine. So um, I guess to, to be complete, what how do you you can use the liver function tests after you do the ablation to make sure everything is safe and that you. Um, uh, did a good job and didn't didn't hurt the patient too much, um, and that is uh, something you do on the follow-up clinic visits. We check those LFTs or liver function tests, also known as enzymes. <coughs> those numbers will definitely go up after you've done ablation, especially the enzymes specifically, and uh, that's not necessarily a concern. Um, but uh, definitely the ablations all cause liver function tests to transiently go up. Yeah. I have a, a couple back-to-back -back questions here. Is are, are the procedures that you were talking about related to proton beam therapy, and how do they compare to the radiation? Okay, so uh, everything we talked about is definitely not related to proton beam radiation, or external beam radiation, or uh, uh, any of the other things that you're hinting at. These are uh, the uh, closest relation is the radio embolization, or the Y90 that we talked about, injecting radioactive particles through an artery. That's the overlap with uh, radiation oncologists who uh, provide radiation through the skin that you're describing. Ah. Um, those two overlap because you can only get so much liver to uh, radiation to any organ, including your liver. So uh, it's a total cumulative dose over your life. So if a guy like me radiates uh, something, a radiation oncologist may not like to use external beam and vice versa. If you've already had radiation externally, uh, then it may not be a good idea to give more radiation through the liver or through the uh, arteries. So uh, they do overlap. Uh, I know you want to know what's, what's better and what should I get. Uh, I mean, of course. Uh, so realize you're talking to a guy that doesn't give external radiation, so I'm certainly biased. Um, I would say that radiation oncology or radiating things from the outside in is, uh, has been around for a long time. It's uh, definitely a useful technology. It's, uh, my preference is not to use it in the liver. The um, problem is the liver moves as you're breathing and, and you, you have to radiate a much larger area of the liver and there's a fair amount of collateral damage. Um, compared to the things we discussed today. So my preference and bias is I think what, what I talked about makes a lot more sense. Now, if you have lymph nodes that are kind of scattered throughout or generally in an area, well, then radiation makes good sense. Maybe if you have something in a muscle or maybe in a, in a bone, I'd say uh, radiation is certainly much more common. There's, there's new technology coming that allows uh, me to treat those things as well, but then that, that gets to be a great area. I don't know what's better. Um, okay. Is, um, <clears throat> is there an age limit for a patient to receive a blade? Oh. Well, that's easy. Nope, there's no age limit. It ah, doesn't matter. Good. Yep. And... And then is uh, somebody wants to know uh, what are major risks to the procedures? Um, right. So I'd say the uh, I've had a, I've had a few lately, which uh, makes me step back and think. But uh, I'd say abscesses. An abscess is an infection, and um, when you uh, when you ablate or destroy tissue, whether it's a tumor or normal, 
you have the risk of it becoming infected. And if it does, it would be a, a cavity where the tumor used to be could become infected, and that's called an abscess. Uh, when that happens, you know, it's not such a bad thing. People don't usually die of that. They may feel pretty crummy. They come back and uh, let me know, and we start antibiotics, and we might even put a little soda straw or smaller size tube into the abscess to drain it out. Um, it's pretty inconvenient and not much fun, and uh, there's a, a, a lot of things that we do to try to prevent that. But that is the complication, I think, that uh, most of us see. Um, what's the rate of complication? That's a real hard question. I'd say it's um, probably lately it's been more like 1 in 20 or so, which I think is pretty high for me. Um, uh, there is a one real big risk factor, which um, I can't be overlooked, and that's if you've ever had a Whipple procedure, or they took out your pancreas, for example, or a GI doc has put a scope in and worked on your gallbladder, or has done anything to the sphincter, um, called the sphincter of Odie. It's the the duct that transmits bile out of your liver. If if that's been messed with then we can assume that it's no longer a, a good valve and, and things can go two directions between the bowel and the liver. Those, those people are at much higher risk of abscess. So uh, I, sometimes even giving antibiotics to try to prevent it, you still fail. The one final useful thing to know is if you do get a, an infection, don't totally give up. Um, I've uh, had quite a few patients where I think the infection helped clean up the, uh, the margins and the edges, but uh, that's certainly not the intent. So. Um, not the end of the world, but that's the main complication. Okay. The other is um, failure to, probably failure to treat the tumor entirely. Maybe it grew, maybe uh, the doc didn't see the margins well enough or the ablation zone didn't cover it completely and it comes back. Um, that happens sometimes, but more often uh, new tumors pop up in areas nearby that are separate events, but um, uh, a tumor in the liver is usually a metastasis, so if you got one, you could get more. And that's that's a real limitation. All righty. Um, a follow-up question to the um, IRE question. And yep. it was, let me find it here. It's kind of, it's, there, let me find it here. Uh, there it is. Can IRE be performed mm -hmm. on a primary tumor in the rectum? Oh, well, that's that's an interesting, potentially loaded question. That's a good one. I would, uh, from some awareness of some things that have been done, I'd say I'd say no. But uh, there's a no. Oh, there's a lot of debate about that. So the device was not intended for that. There's uh, not really sure. Um, uh, I would say no. I would say someday maybe. I'd say you may find some people to try it, but the conservative. Uh, um, approach would certainly be to say no, that's for sure. I could imagine cases where somebody might consider doing that, but uh, you'd have to have an awfully good reason. If you want to get into legal terms, it's certainly not the standard of care, in my opinion, but you'll get other opinions. Um, the problem is that the, the, the primary tumor is connected to a loop of bowel, right? And the loop of bowel is full of stool and bacteria and air. You can't let that stuff get into the beyond the tumor, into the abdomen or pelvis. And uh, when you put needles in things and burn stuff, then you create holes potentially and you may allow that to happen. So the standard of care is certainly surgery or radiation. Um, and uh, well, I'd, I'd be pretty hesitant to uh, do an IRE of the rectum. I, I mean, personally, I wouldn't. But uh, I could imagine technology changing someday, but not, not in the near future. OK. Uh, what kind of chemo can you deliver with the beads, there seems to be confusion with you know the the bead okay. being the Y90 and and chemotherapy being a different right. methodology. Can you combine RFI with RFA? Excuse me, with embolization or beads? Okay, so embolization just means you're injecting uh, beads, and those beads can be radioactive, like yttrium, or they can contain chemotherapy, uh, like chemoembolization or TACE. So uh, you're asking what what kind of drugs can you put? in those particles when you're doing a taste or chemo embo. You can put doxorubicin, you can put uh, arena tecan. Uh, 20 years ago we put three drugs plus some other stuff. Um, uh, you know, I don't think it matters that much to tell you the truth. I think a lot of people would probably have pretty strong beliefs that certain things work better from others. There's a study recently showed that B 
beads just by themselves without the drug might work just as well. So that's a pretty controversial kind of statement. I don't know the truth. I don't think anybody does. I think uh, definitely standard of care to put a uh, drug into those beads and you get the potential effect of embolization plus the drug elution or drug coming out of the beads. And uh, can you do, the third question is, can you do chemoembolization plus ablation like RFA? So yes, you can. And in fact, um, that is an interesting area I've been exploring. What if you got a tumor that's a, uh, too big for uh, RFA or needle ablation, but is kind of small. It's kind of too small that you don't want to really sacrifice the wedge of liver going through the artery, or use the nuclear bomb. So I, I call it yttrium. You want to kind of save that for later if you have a, a difficult problem. So um, you can, you, yes, you can potentially embolize with chemoembolization first let it shrink a little bit, maybe over a month, and come back and use percutaneous or through the skin RFA or microwave or one of those other things and uh, try to clean up the margins. And that kind of combined treatment is a little bit of a new idea. Last four or five years, I'd say, is I've been seeing things written. I've certainly been trying that, and I've had some real good results. Um, so yes, you can certainly do that. I would say your chance of an abscess definitely goes up when you're doing two things at once. But like I said, an abscess is not the end of the world. Not great, and it's certainly not intentional, but um, might be worth it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've got a question here from a Lynch person, uh, Lynch syndrome. Who's uh, this individual is Lynch positive? Uh, uh, for patients who are or who have Lynch syndrome, what would you mm -hmm. recommend for treatment? Since a mutated gene can cause various cancers throughout the individual's lifetime and throughout their treatment. Oh, I see. So um, I, uh, I think you're describing something like a familial adenomatous polyposis coli, that long name for basically inherited um, uh, predilection for colon cancer. Um, so uh, if we're talking about those types of patients, of which there's many out there, basically you're born with a high risk of getting a colon cancer, what do you do? Um, well, uh, hopefully you, you get screened with colonoscopy and they, they take out those uh, polyps before they become tumors. Uh, if they miss one or somehow uh, one is lost and it just goes straight to the liver, uh, then we treat them the same. It doesn't matter uh, really um, uh, if you have a genetic predisposition for a disease. Once it's a tumor in the liver, it's, it's a pretty simple pathway. Um, like we described. So uh, I think I hope I'm answering your question. If not, maybe type it in again. All right. And what are the advantages of thermal ablation over CyberKnife for Mets in the liver? Oh, okay. So uh, CyberKnife, I'm thinking. Uh, so there's these these vendors uh, or companies, which are great, don't get me wrong, they invent great things that we use, we'd have nothing without them. They come up with names for things like cyber knife, and uh, so that's really, I, I believe we're describing uh, external beam radiation given by a radiation oncologist, which is not me, that's someone who just gives external radiation. Um, and it's uh, the concept is that maybe it, it causes less collateral damage, a little more precise. Um, what are the advantages of what I do over that? Well, um, that's a little hard to say, to tell you the truth. I think, uh, I think both are potentially viable options. I like what I described today because it makes good sense to me, and I don't have to damage any surrounding liver if we're going through the skin, and I can potentially control how much we're damaging if we're going through the artery. But uh, I think there's, there are definitely cases where radiation makes sense. And uh, CyberKnife is just kind of a fancier, multi-dimensional way of giving it, basically. The guys that are offering it to you bought an expensive machine that um, does a more precise job, and certainly that's a good thing. Um, the, the cost of doing that is, in, in my world, is that if you've had that, you may not be able to get radio embolization in the future. Uh, because, like I said, radiation is cumulative, and whether you call it a cyber knife or external beam, it's still, it's still dose. Um, so it starts to get a little bit risky to, to do more than uh, you know, two things at once. Okay. So, uh, all righty. We uh, we got just a little over ten minutes left, and we have three questions that are still waiting. Okay. Presented here. Um, what is the best rationale to use to request a referral to a radiation 
oncologist or to an interventional radiologist from right. uh, their treating oncologist. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I guess uh, you may be asking sort of the, a political question. So, so I've got this medical oncologist that I like and I rely on them, and they're giving me chemo, and I'm trusting them, and and they're we're getting along, and uh, suddenly I'm thinking. I, I listened to this presentation, or I read some articles, and I think, you know, maybe I should be getting a, an additional treatment. I said, should see an IR guy or a radonc uh, person. Um, how do I present that to my doc, maybe without insulting them, or um, um, that sort of thing, maybe is what you're asking. I would say um, we don't overlap, actually, that much with the medical oncologist. In fact, um, they're, uh, from a business perspective, uh, we're not really competing. We work together. In fact, Almost all the patients I see also have a medical oncologist. Um, sometimes patients come to me first, and I'll almost always have them see a medical oncologist also uh, because uh, the chemotherapy and ev all the other fancy things we described, they're really very much complementary. Um, cancer is a tough thing to deal with, right? So uh, you don't usually want to rule out a possibility. Maybe you would do well to get um, both, or maybe get chemo first and ablation second, or vice versa. So uh, hopefully the rationale to bring that up would be that, hey, I'm, a, I'm an informed person. I, I read about these things. I listened to some stuff. Would you mind sending me to one so I can talk to them? I would say if 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 you're in a small town where they're not that available, there aren't as many of us around as there are uh, uh, medical oncologists, so we sometimes are a little harder to see, but pretty much any major city, you know, half a million to a million or more, will have its, uh, one hospital where they have interventional radiologists. Um, having said that, in southern Arizona, I get referrals from other states and um, that have to drive quite a ways to come see me. Um, so I, I would say it, it certainly never hurts to talk, um, but uh, definitely if you're thinking, you know, every time I see a surgeon, they want to cut me. Every time I see an interventional radiologist, they want to stick me with the needle. There is a risk of that. That's, uh, that's real. But hopefully you're better informed now and you can ask better questions and, and um, talk about size and what tools you got and make your own decision. I mean, that's, that's the way it hopefully would work. Okay. Uh, you just uh, mentioned, you know, risks and... There was a question here regarding risk. Um, mm -hmm. is what, are, what are, if any, uh, the risks if a patient has hepatitis B or C? Right. So, um, so this, this was focused a lot on uh, colon cancer, right? But hepatitis B and C are viruses. You have them in your liver that cause cirrhosis over many years. A cirrhotic liver is one in which tumors pop up. They're called hepatocellular carcinomas or HCCs. And um, so what do we do with them? In fact, that is a big part of what I do every day. I treat people with hepatocellular carcinomas in their liver that came from hep B or hep C. Um, all of the things, the principles we talked about today are pretty much identical. Uh, some of the differences are that um, uh, people with uh, cirrhosis in their liver, the risk of bleeding is a bit higher. So if you had asked me the risks of colon cancer, ablations and things, I'd tell you abscess. If you asked me in the context of a cirrhotic liver, I would say uh, bleeding. Uh, fortunately, we don't have much of a problem with that. In fact, I can't remember the last time I had a, a serious bleed, but that would be the main risk. Um, so uh, all these principles apply to hep B and C um, almost unchanged. All righty. And... Um, just real quickly, if you could again uh, go over what kind of qualifications should um, one of our attendees ask for in an IR doctor doing these procedures? Okay, yeah. So um, um, I guess uh, so. A, a lot of rules have exceptions. I would say if you if you're offered the chance to talk to an IR doc and they they don't have a clinic setting, in other words, they only want to see you on the day of the procedure and let somebody else make the decision for them and uh, don't necessarily want to get to know you first and be involved in the decision process and all that. I would say that that could be a tip-off um, that maybe you're dealing with somebody that um, uh, isn't the ideal type. Um, there's some docs out there that have been practicing for a long time who are really highly skilled but aren't used to that method of practice as in having a clinic first and they rely on the surgeon or the med doc to send them the correct patients and they just do the technical procedure part. 
I think that's legitimate. That's getting phased out. Uh, I think it's not ideal, so I think that'd be one of the first decision points I would consider. I'd like to see. I want. I want somebody who's going to talk to me face to face first and follow me up. Um, the others are, are um, uh, the size of the medical center. You know, the bigger the medical center, the more IR docs you're going to have, and you'll have sort of sub sub specialization. You'll have individuals who are especially good at particular diseases, and others that do other things. So, bigger is usually better. Bigger medical center, probably better IR docs. There's absolutely exceptions to that, no doubt. But we're just talking broad strokes, um, and I, I think I answered your question. I hope so. Alrighty. And are you aware of any uh, good institutions in the Philly area? I know there's Penn and Fox Chase, and then I believe Kimmel's over there as well. Well, U U Penn has a great reputation for radiology, and IR is kind of a subset grew out of radiology. So. If you uh, assume that uh, that good radiology reputation applies to IR, then UPenn would be a great choice, I think. Um, we have a faculty who is there, and that's uh, pretty respectable. But uh, to be fair, I don't know that part of the country nearly as well, so I can't really do other places justice, but that's certainly one that comes to mind. Very good. And um, I do want to thank everybody for their questions here. And uh, we are just about out of time for this evening, but as a reminder, all of you will receive a follow-up email tomorrow about this time. Uh, that email will have a link to the recording of this webinar, and it'll also have a link to a very, very, very short survey to let us know how we did. But we really value your opinion, and I, uh, we want to hear back from you, and I promise it'll only take a minute or two, so thank you in advance for your help. Um, that, that's pretty much everything we have for this evening. Um, but we'd like you to please consider joining us next month for our next two webinars where we'll be providing a recap of the treatment options and advances and research findings being published at the American Society of Clinical Oncology, ASCO, uh, Gastrointestinal Cancer Symposium going on right now in San Francisco. We will be hosting uh, another webinar on how you can volunteer for the Colon Cancer Alliance, where we'll share outreach tools and education materials along with tips and tricks that can help you make a real difference in your community. The registration for those are open right now. Uh, please visit our website at ccalliance.org and visit the news and webinar area located in the get information section and register now. Before we go, if you have any uh, challenges uh, regarding financial support or treatment questions that you want to ask in a more personal one-on-one -on -one setting, you can speak directly with one of our patient, cert our, uh, patient and family support navigators by calling our helpline at 877-422-2030. You can also visit them online for a live chat at ccalliance.org. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. We hope you enjoyed this webinar. I would especially like to thank Dr. Hennemeyer for being with us this evening. We appreciate your expertise and, um, and your experience in helping our patient community. It was very informative, Dr. Hennemeyer. Any parting words? Okay. No, that's great. I appreciate everybody listening. I hope it's helpful. And uh, I definitely appreciate feedback. So if you fill out the survey, tell me what's good and what's not. Uh, I definitely like to hear it. And uh, don't be uh, don't be nice. Tell me the truth. All right. <laughs> Thanks very much. All right. Excellent. This webinar is being recorded, and all registrants and attendees will receive that link tomorrow to the recording. And if you have any questions regarding that webinar, please feel free to email me at kbergerson at ccalliance.org. On behalf of the entire Colon Cancer Alliance team, I'd like to thank everyone for attending this webinar. I hope you found it informative and value-added. Have a good evening and take care, everyone.